since growing up, like science fiction has always been my favorite genre of film and, and favorite genre of books. And I think just growing up, like as a kid, you know, I'm sure a lot of people can relate. You know, we kind of grow up having like, you know, this whimsical idea of what it, you know, what like outer space is like and, you know, the thought of like traveling um, through space and to other planets, etc. And, you know, I really wanted to convey that uh, in combination with some of the more recent kind of inspirations I've had um, from minimalism and like interior design, uh, especially like mid-century design, I think is something that um, really inspired me when I was first starting digitally illustrating. And so I kind of wanted to combine both of those things that really like inspired me over the years. And I can't recall at this point what the first space illustration I did was. I believe it was a flight over Neptune right here in the middle, but I, I could be wrong. Uh, but regardless, I remember like after creating that first one and using kind of that negative space and that, you know, predominantly white background, um, I felt like I created something special and I just wanted to continue on with the series. Um, and, you know, over the course of time, I've kind of polished what I wanted to convey, but ultimately, you know, it still is this kind of fascination with outer space and kind of this, you know, this, uh, you know, just this kind of fictional idea of what it's like to, you know, travel through space in kind of a more mid-century-esque kind of maybe, you know, interior. So, you know, also kind of inspired by 2001 A Space Odyssey, you know, maybe not, I think quite heavily, but, you know, I guess we can talk more in depth about that too, if you want. Yeah, I really love the contrast, you know, the blacks and the whites really pop out you. And, you know, there's a sense of longing in this series. Is that just my perspective or was this something that you were trying to convey? No, it is something that I intentionally wanted to convey. I mean, some of them don't have people in them. I guess most of them do, but just a single person. I don't think I actually have one that has more than a single person. And really, it's just like trying to um, have an emotion of just loneliness. You know, I think outer space, you know, is almost an infinite kind of, uh, at least what we know is basically an infinite kind of space that projects on forever. And, you know, I kind of wanted to convey that, uh, that feeling within the context of my art as well. This series really came about when I moved over to Wisconsin for school, uh, both undergrad and medical school. I think um, you know, it, it really, you know, the style really started with my Midwest series. And that was really kind of a interpretation of how I perceived moving to the Midwest because it was such a stark contrast from where I grew up. And then over the course of time, as I lived in, um, as I lived in Wisconsin, I began to kind of feel, uh, you know, slowly separated from where I grew up in California. And so I wanted to create a series that kind of reflected, um, you know, the scenery and the and the landscapes that really kind of inspired my imagination as a kid growing up. And I think by that point, I had the style and the tools uh, at my disposal uh, that I wanted, you know, and I was able to adequately kind of showcase exactly how I wanted to uh, share this vision I had of kind of my childhood growing up in California. And so a lot of the um, works are kind of a fictional imagination of um, the Bay Area, um, more of somewhat rural farmland in California, anywhere from, you know, Central Valley, from the Bay Area down to, you know, Southern California. Um, and um, I, I think growing up as a kid, you know, we would drive from city to city a lot, just, you know, visiting different cities and in between would just be, you know, large and long stretches of farmland. And I think those are the times that I really was inspired, you know, just looking out the window in the backseat of my parents' car. And so those are just some of the um, things I wanted to convey in my art. No, I, I actually never went to Wisconsin. I, I think uh, I didn't even know where Wisconsin was on a map before I went to Wisconsin. And so it was definitely something completely new to me. And um, you know, it was a little scary at first going, you know, I didn't know a single person and, you know, I didn't really know the culture there, but I, I really enjoyed my time and I still enjoy my time here uh, in Wisconsin since I continue to live here. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I think it's just a very different kind of landscape a very different culture and vibe uh, from California. Yeah. You know, I think when I first created this, um, I, 
you know, I, I can't recall if this is exactly how it went down, but there was a point in time where I was kind of going down this rabbit hole of, uh, like, PETA, animal cruelty, like how, like, the food industry works in terms of, you know, processing, you know, the meat that we consume. And, you know, I'm not a vegan by any means, but it does, you know, make me sad to think about those things. And so I wanted to just, you know, highlight some of that through my art. And I think I... You know, I created this and another kind of cow related work, um, you know, because, you know, if, if you ever, you know, interacted with a cow, you know, they have so much attitude and character. And so, you know, very much so, you know, going along with the title, The Last Supper, I mean, there's no explicit message, but I'm sure there's a lot of implications that you can you know, kind of garner from looking at it and, and reading the title. But yeah, it does depict six, uh, 13 cows um, kind of in an ominous tone in California somewhere. Um, with that sky, you know, maybe it's cloudy, maybe it's getting dark, maybe it's raining in the back, you know, you don't really know. If I can recall, the very first piece I created on PowerPoint between all of these was this one, Ocean View here, which is the third one to the to the right. And this was probably a couple months into using PowerPoint. I think I created one illustration from my anthropology class um, and then I was like, you know, oh, this is kind of cool. And then I think this was either the second or the third illustration I made on, you know, PowerPoint. And, and it really is like, you know, you take the the square tool and then you take the circle tool. The circle tool is basically those clouds in the back. They're just white circles kind of stacked on top of each other. Um, then there's like the triangle tool, which is used to kind of convey the, the boat in the back. And then maybe that little shadow at the center of the piece that's kind of diagonal. And then the rest is really just like the rectangle square tool. And then all I did was, you know, I just used some gradients, uh, you know, for the, for the background colors and that was really it. And so, um, I think between all of these, you know, I was just really exploring, um, how to use the the tools at my disposal, which at the time was really just PowerPoint, or I think it might have been Keynote, which is like the Mac version, but it's basically an identical software. And um, at that time, I think was when I was really kind of learning about art in general. I think before that, I enjoyed being an artist, but I wouldn't have necessarily called myself an artist. It's, you know, just a hobbyist who likes to draw on sketchbooks and stuff. But this was around the time that I was exposed to more of the kind of, uh, you know, the, the museums around Madison, Wisconsin, and in Madison, Wisconsin, um, which there are quite a bit, and they're wonderful museums as well. And so that's kind of around the time I was really learning about art, both online and in person. And so, you know, I kind of wanted to um, try to take a stab at some of the things that inspired me. And so this is kind of a whole kind of outline of things um, as I kind of went through teaching myself how to use the software from the ground up and also learning uh, just about art in general. I, I used PowerPoint because I just didn't know what other options there were for digitally illustrating. I mean, of course I knew there was, there was something out there, but I just didn't, you know, take the time to learn about it. Um, also, you know, being in college, you know, you don't have that much money. And so it's not like I was going to spend a lot of money, you know, buying, you know, like Adobe, this or that, um, which I think at the time was quite expensive as well. Um, and then of course, you know, there were some like free softwares and stuff, but still, you know, I kind of just uh, accepted that maybe I could just use this as a way to illustrate. And honestly, it was like, um, just because I didn't really do my due diligence. I just, just said, you know, this thing could potentially work. And so I just started using it. Um, and then that transition from more kind of physical to digital, I mean, like I had mentioned before, I was really more of a hobbyist. I mean, I did a lot of stencil paint, paintings, like spray paintings, and I did a lot of sketching. Like I had, I have tons of sketchbooks everywhere lying around, um, of illustrations and stuff, but, um, I, I would have really called myself a hobbyist. I mean, even a hobbyist at this point, right? But I think at this point, I was getting a little bit more serious um, and, and more kind of into what I wanted to show uh, and, and, you know, kind of what I wanted to share with people. Yeah, you know, I think Sander Station was something that really inspired me because of the minimalism uh, aspect of it. You know, I didn't know anything about pop art at the time. I didn't know anything. Well, like besides like, you know, I knew who like Andy Warhol was, but you know, I didn't really know anything about pop art in general. I didn't really know anything about Ed Ruscha in general at all as well. I just saw his name kind of on the, you know, kind of the placard, you know, next to the, the work standard station at the museum. Um, 
but you know, I think there was something about the sharp lines that really stuck out to me because that was basically how I was illustrating, right? I mean, I was creating, I was basically just using the square, rectangle, triangle tools. And so it almost looked reminiscent of, you know, my work, um, but in a painting form. And so, you know, obviously there was a, oh, I guess not painting, but you know, like a, it was like a print work, right? But it was still like very masterfully done on physical medium. And so it really did inspire me. Um, and then of course the piece itself, if you ever have a chance to look at it, I mean, it, there's a lot of negative space that's used and it really just kind of is almost, I think, you know, definitely part of it like inspired how I created the space series that we just talked about behind us because there really is, at least when I look at that piece, like a sense of longing and kind of emptiness uh, in that work that, you know, by Ed Ruscha. And so, um, yeah, and so there was a lot of things that inspired me about it. But in terms of this work, SNI Fencing, yeah, I mean, it did, that work did inspire this, but at the same time, this was a real place in Madison. And I actually got a DM from someone who either lives in Madison or recently visited Madison. And they said that they're actually tearing this building down. It used to be on uh, Willie Street in Madison. And so that building might not even exist anymore. If you take a look at this entire series as a whole, besides the leftmost one, the leftmost one I think is kind of still a uh, reminiscent of my um, you know, kind of uh, going back to my inspirations with science fiction growing up, I think it's definitely pays homage to that. Um, but kind of the rest of the pieces, I mean, they are, if you think about like looking at this and then what we'll talk about later in the gallery, I mean, they're basically uh, everything that I created in this style that I have today kind of in its infancy. And this is kind of the um, kind of the ground zero for, you know, all the stuff that I create today. And so you, you kind of have landscape works, you kind of have interior works, minimalist interior works, um, uses of like a lot of negative space. And I think these are themes that I still use and incorporate today. And so it's not so much what I want to continue exploring based off of these works. I mean, I think it's more so I continue to explore um, the style and, and the way I approach artworks. Um, kind of from the time I started creating works on PowerPoint. I mean, Wisconsin is the dairy state. Uh, there's a lot of cows and lots of dairy. Um, and so this was definitely just like a, uh, just a piece of the puzzle in terms of the rest of the series that I have. And if you look at the rest of the series, you'll see that it is a fairly complete series, in my opinion, just like from themes and from color wise, you know, color wise. Uh, but, you know, this is actually one of the final pieces I minted um, on ETH. Um, from that series. And the reason it took me so long to mint this was because I felt like um, there was something lacking. Not something lacking. I, I enjoyed the work itself, but I just felt maybe people wouldn't appreciate it as much as I did because, I mean, in all honesty, I mean, it's just a single color with like maybe a hint of black and a hint of a hint of white in it, you know? And so um, I personally thought that uh, it wouldn't be received very well, but Defiance, who still owns the piece today, you know, we made a deal um, on Super Rare whenever this got minted, uh, and he, you know, found a huge amount of interest in it, and he was very supportive, and so, you know, I thought, you know, why not just go through with this deal, and so, you know, we, I sold him the work, and honestly, the rest is history. I uh, went to, and, and I'm sure people have heard the story um, and maybe read about it, but very briefly, I went to the Whitney uh, down in, you know, um, Manhattan a few years ago, uh, or, or I guess not more than a few years ago, quite a long time ago now. Um, but at that time, I was they were having a kind of a exhibition of all of Grant Wood's works. And so they brought in, you know, mo all his, like basically all his most like famous pieces from you know, museum, museums all around the United States. And there was this amazing kind of full exhibition of all his works. And honestly, I think that's when it really struck me, like, you know, like this is kind of the type of art and the type of scenery I want to convey through my art. I think prior to that, of course, I was still illustrating and you know, I was creating those works on PowerPoint. But soon afterwards, I you know, I was heavily inspired by kind of the way Grant Wood approached the way he creates sceneries and landscapes. And so um, very much so I went home and I, you know, wanted to kind of create a series uh, reflecting back on my experiences in the Midwest, because a lot of Grant Wood's works, you know, he grew up in Iowa, he, he trained in Europe and he was inspired by the Impressionists. And then he came back to Iowa um, and he really kind of 
represented um, the Midwest and in, in Iowa and the way his family grew up um, in Iowa as farmers. And I think I have a very different experience of the Midwest, but I wanted to showcase how I viewed the Midwest and how I kind of viewed, um, you know, how, how I wanted to share that kind of experience. And so, yeah, I'd say that was probably the most monumental uh, contributing factor to the series that I created. This is like, uh, you know, something that anyone can say, like, you know, you really don't know what it would have been like if you had lived somewhere else, right? Like, I don't know what my life would be like if I had lived or, or went to school somewhere else in the United States. But I think growing, you know, kind of growing up as an adult here um, from undergrad into kind of more of my graduate degree uh, and, you know, going through art along the way, I think I've done my best to try and go to as many museums in the area as possible. I mean, I've driven to Iowa and many, you know, like Minneapolis, Minnesota, and all through uh, Illinois and Wisconsin uh, to go to museums and galleries and to really see how other artists from the area interpret uh, this region of the United States. And I've learned a lot from that. And honestly, I think uh, I wouldn't have wanted it any other way. And, and it's a, it's a, wonderful place here, I think, you know, kind of in the Midwest, you know, a lot of people think of it as mostly farmland, which honestly it is, but there's also cultural hubs around here, you know, I think between Milwaukee and Chicago, uh, Minneapolis, you know, I mean, it, there is a lot of culture in terms of the art scene and the art world. And so uh, I've learned a lot and, you know, I think uh, I wouldn't want it any other way. My favorite pastime really is going on road trips and it's really the journey that really like is the fun part for me i mean i absolutely love sitting in a car for six you know plus hours just looking out the window because there's just so much to take in you know and i think that's a lot of stuff that people don't like about road trips kind of the mundane parts driving through the same you know kind of farmland over and over again but to me i mean that is like a big portion of why you know, I'm known for the art that I create today. And so I absolutely love, you know, kind of the longer road trips and, and kind of the more mundane scenery that you drive through. I don't really necessarily see another reason to do another burn or any kind of mechanism like that. And so it might be the first and the last, honestly. But no, this was, uh, yeah, it was definitely the burn mechanism from Nifty Gateway. Um, you know, the piece in the dead center, of course, one apartment was the first work. And then a year later, entire year later, I did the road ahead. You know, you burn the two to get the one on the right. And I just personally felt like the story of school and apartments was not complete without the rest of the illustration, which was already either completed by the time I had released school and apartments or was basically very close to being completed. And so um, I wanted to share the completion of that story a year later uh, with this kind of entire drop I did with Nifty. Andrew and I have known each other for a very long time. And um, like, I didn't know he was a creative coder at all. He was a soft, I just knew he was a software engineer who worked um, at Epic uh, at the time. And so he worked just kind of in geographical proximity to where I went to school, which is how I met him. Um, but I remember he visit, came to visit me one day um, in, in Wisconsin after he had moved away. And he was, I was trying to tell him about what I was doing with NFTs. And I, then I shared like, you know, what a Fidenza was, what a squiggle was, what like art blocks was. And then he was, and then I think like he had this moment where his eyes lit up and he told me that, you know, he has been doing creative coding, you know, since he graduated college. So this is like several years, you know, into knowing each other um, and having our friendship. And honestly, I think it only took it probably like an hour um, before like we had, you know, kind of come to the conclusion that we should collaborate and work on something special. And really, um, we kind of took this idea that I had um, from some of the pieces behind us, actually, uh, which is this um, the study for Premier. I, I can't even remember the name what, uh, of what it's called, but these nine pieces here on the wall behind us. Um, and I was really inspired at the time by kind of 1920s, 1930s kind of artists, um, and like Malevich and stuff. And I really wanted to create a generative drop that was kind of represented this, uh, this concept that I had, but, you know, of course I'm not a coder and I, and also, also I think at the time there wasn't really very much 
generative art exploring this kind of theme. And so I thought it was perfect to kind of fill this niche in and also to fulfill like to fulfill my dreams. And so, you know, I really worked in collaboration with Andrew and, and we dropped this generative work after working for quite a bit. Actually, I can't recall exactly what the duration of time was. Um, but yeah, we I think there's 400 pieces and we dropped that 0.09 ETH. Um, and it did, I think it took a couple days to actually mint out because, um, you know, we were just kind of writing solo. It wasn't in collaboration with a platform or anything. Andrew uh, knew Solidity, so he had all the technical skills to write the contract himself and, and everything like that. And so it was basically kind of a grassroots project between us two. And and um, and honestly, like every every passing day, I'm more and more proud of the visual aesthetic, but also just what we did as a collaborative team. And I think moving forward, you know, I think I'll be friends with him for a very long time. You know, I talk to him every day and honestly, you know, I don't think there's anything coming like in the immediate future, but I mean, I could see us doing a drop in even say 50, 60 years if, you know, we're still alive and we're still friends. So, you know, I kind of had a, a lot of kind of rough sketches like drawn by hand and then he would go through um, Andrew would go through the process with me about like how coding actually works and how um, it works to create a composition and then of course um, how to randomly generate something that looks similar to that but is not identical um, and then you know kind of etc cetera, etc cetera. and it was really kind of a going through a process like that and then of course back and forth between like you know is this um, something that we want to like convey through this code or you know is this not something that you want to or is this something that you don't want to convey? And I think it was a lot of back and forth between like learning a little bit about, you know, how he goes about coding and then him learning a, a little bit more about like what my overall vision for the project was. And then ultimately us coming to um, kind of a consensus and an agreement of what the visual aesthetics should look like, because they're not identical to the ones that we have here um, in my earlier sketches. But honestly, um, I couldn't be more proud of what we created. Um, I think, you know, we just wanted to share the art. I think uh, my thesis for creating art when I first started was, you know, I wanted to, I just want to share my art with as many people as possible. I mean, I, you know, I remember doing prints for friends long before NFTs. I remember doing digital, like, I remember just doing like random prints on like those websites, like Sticker Mule or whatever, and, and just like printing for friends. And, you know, I would only print to break even, I would only charge to break even basically. And so I've always been kind of, uh, my idea has always been like, I just want to share my art with as many people as possible. And CC0 is probably the best way to go about doing that. Um, I think looking back now, there's a lot since kind of this whole CC0 craze uh, up until now. I think the narrative of CC0 has become much more nuanced. I think it's always been nuanced, but I think people realize now there's a lot more kind of uh, twists and turns when it comes to cc 0 and your body of work. Um, and so not all my work is actually CC0, but this one is, the cow is, and a few others. Um, and I have yet to CC0 all my art. I mean, you know, for the most part, I won't go after someone who uses my art in any way, of course, unless it's done very maliciously, but um, I just haven't CC0 just yet because I think a lot of these conversations are still ongoing and, and it's better, you know, I just kind of wait and see, you know, kind of how this narrative kind of plays itself out before I preempt uh, prematurely, you know, CC0 everything. I think the way I felt probably, you know, I, 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 I'm just like overwhelmingly thankful, honestly. I, I don't think there's any other way I could describe how I feel. I think it's very difficult to put into words. And I'm sure some of the artists who are listening uh, or who plan on listening, um, you know, after this is recorded, know just how it feels when a collector purchases your art. And then, you know, especially for a price that you didn't think that your art could go for. And so I think, you know, Overall, I've just been very thankful and very uh, humbled by the support that I've had from collectors and the community overall. Um, but at the same time, I think it is very validating that this collection well was well received because um, it's a newer collection and it's a kind of a real time collection in the sense that it is kind of an ongoing series where it is a where I'm creating pieces in real time in the sense that 
it is a uh, I'm creating pieces based off of new experiences that I'm creating um, as I travel to the middle uh, as I travel to the Northeast and New England area um, quite often these days. And so, yeah, no, it's, it's really honestly been a wonderful time just, you know, creating the series. And and honestly, it's been very validating. I think at first, like to be entirely honest with you, I think at first I had a, uh, I can't remember what the first day and night piece was, but I remember I had a day piece and I thought, you know, why not just switch to colors and see what happens? It, it really wasn't anything beyond that. I just thought, you know, why not just turn everything dark and turn it into nighttime? And for some reason, I think it just turned out so well that and it looked like an entirely different body of like an entirely different piece. I mean, I cr I've now been able to create an entire body of work that was kind of just a counterpart to the day pieces that I have. And I think a lot of the times what works is that it's mostly based off of my pieces of landscape work and landscapes dramatically change from day to night as you know as everyone knows you know you know you look out your window and it looks dramatically different from day to night and i think those stark differences in in colors those stark differences in lighting ultimately creates an entirely different composition and entirely different theme and entirely different set of emotions that um that's you know remains unique to itself and so um, after I created a few nighttime works, I realized there's something very special about it. And so I continue to do that today. I'll be honest, I don't know what my favorite piece of the series is. I, and I probably can't tell you off the top of my head right now, but this definitely is a work that I really do like. Um, and it probably is one of my more favorite pieces, but I, I honestly couldn't tell you what my favorite piece is. I will say working with AO team has been wonderful. I mean, I know each member of the team um, prior to even like prior to them creating AOTM um, and joining AOTM. Um, and of course, you know, I do support their vision and, and they've supported me for a very long time now. And so I think it's really been a symbiotic relationship. And um, and yeah, I think this piece, Life in New York is something, NYC is something that I'm very proud of. And and uh, and yeah, that's, that's about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I grew up um, mostly in California, but I frequently spent a lot of time in Korea. Uh, I am, you know, my parents are Korean and all my extended family lives in Korea. And um, there were a few times we were able to travel to Japan. Um, I think to a foreigner, and I would consider myself more so a foreigner than anything, you know, Korea and Japan, the architecture is slightly different, but there's a lot of overlap and a lot of similarities. And so this whole series is basically kind of this uh, conglomerate of memories that I have both you know, kind of living for short periods of time in Korea, traveling to Japan, and then also kind of a more westernized, uh, romanticized idealization of what Japan looks like. You know, I'll be honest with you, I think when I create art in general, there's really no rhyme or reason as to why I use particular colors. I mean, I remember I was doing an interview the other day, um, or, or last year, and we we're going over this concept about picking colors and honestly it's really comes down to just a color wheel and i just pick colors until you know i just choose colors and i just keep going at it until i find the right combination of colors and for some reason uh a quiet day in the neighborhood like that set of colors worked just fine and it actually looked really good and so uh it's really just been using that set of colors uh, kind of throughout the entire series overall. I will say, I think if you look towards the most right piece feelings, I think that one does kind of remind me, at least for myself, it does remind me more of like those earlier kind of Game Boy Advance, uh, Super Nintendo kind of Japanese built video games like, you know, Mother or Pokemon and stuff like that. I think the color palette is fairly similar. And so there might be some subconscious or maybe conscious explicit um, kind of inspirations from that as well. I just finished playing Fallout 4 and I finished the story actually, but then I bought uh, I bought Red Dead Redemption 2, but because of like the snow and the polar vortex, it's like been backed up from Amazon for like a week now. And so I've been kind of grinding random quests on Fallout 4, but hopefully Red Dead Redemption should come pretty soon. And so I'll probably grind that one out too. And let's just look at the back wall with the Northeast pieces. Um, we can go very briefly, I think, 
talk about the ones on the right with the squiggles and then the ones on the left that were in collaboration with Avon Art. So the ones on the right, the two squiggles, I think, um, I, I, I think this is something that I really do enjoy doing because, um, I don't really know how to phrase this, but I think like growing up playing video games actually, or, or watching movies or TV shows, I just love Easter eggs. You know, I, I love like playing a video game and then you see like the video game makers, you know, did a hat tip, you know, paid homage to another video game or some other reference um, to a movie or something or a common trope. And I think very similarly, I like doing that in my art uh, whenever I find the opportunity. Like um, if you go into the first room, the spaceman um, in one of my pieces um, has a space and primary. It has like Ethereum logo on it. Um, if you look at the other, I think, I can't remember the title of the piece, but there's another space series work that's in the main room, in the first room. If you like adjust the contrast all the way up, it'll say, uh, I can't remember even what it says. It says like FOMO or something in it, which is kind of just like, you know, FOMO is what we talk about a lot in Web3. And so very similarly, I, I just wanted to create something that is like, has some other connection to Web3. And I think Squiggles is a project that inspires a lot of artists and um, is almost like um, spearheading Web3 focused art. And so it's really been a wonderful opportunity to be able to create kind of commissioned works to particular collectors. Like the one on the left is for Flamingo and the one on the right actually is for Snowfro himself. And so um, I love doing works like this and I hopefully, you know, moving forward, I can do works uh, very similar to this, whether it's more squiggles or, or other collections that I think are very important to the Web3 narrative. And then, of course, on the left here are my two Avon artworks. I think um, it's hard to showcase both of these on the digital screen. I think Sid did a wonderful job and, you know, I think OnCyber did a wonderful job. I just think that because they're physical works, um, it would be wonderful if one day everyone listening to this gets a chance to look at the physical work um, in, in person because it does tell a different story in my opinion. I think a lot of the work that I create is based on or, or has the intention of um, being printed and, and being shown in physical form, which is why I very rarely do animation based art because I really want to create art that looks like paintings and then, you know, displayed physically um, without kind of backlit screens and, and more so on paper or other kind of physical canvases. And so these two works, I think, um, are the two drops that I did with Avon Art so far. And also, I think. It's helped me a lot over the past year or two, uh, just kind of building connections in Web3 and kind of the overarching art world. And so it's had a more profound impact um, kind of behind the scenes than people might realize. And so um, I'm really glad that, you know, Sid and, and, you know, the rest of the team was able to put this uh, kind of showcase these two works as well in this gallery. Totally. I also am a huge fan of physicals. Where's the best place to go and see a physical of this? Do you have it um, in a gallery somewhere? Unfortunately, I don't. And I think actually, well, maybe fortunately, I think it's great that it's kind of hoarded and vaulted by kind of diehard collectors um, because you'll really have to look hard to, to be able to see one in person. <laughs> Gotcha. Maybe I'll have to print one out and just put it on my wall and look at it then. You won't go after me, right? <laughs> but um, I, I love that tidbit that you were talking about with the the FOMO messaging on on one of your space pieces. Do you have any other sort of like hidden Easter eggs in, in any of your artworks? Um, I don't. Oh, yeah, I guess the one on the very right, if you look just at the very right down the hall, it's, of course, the cowboy. And that's actually... You know, I don't even know how to pronounce his name. Um, it's B-A-L-O-N. I know it's like Balan Balloon. I don't know. I don't know if he's even listening to this, but um, but anyways, most people know him as the cowboy punk, and uh, uh, he works for Metaverse One, and, and uh, he commissioned me actually to do this work, and so it's actually a drawing of a punk, and so it's his punk, and so I do have a couple punks I've illustrated over the over the years, and I really do enjoy illustrating people's punks, and so I'm always, you know, open to doing that. I love that. Um, do you have a lot of commissions right now in the pipeline, um, and how involved are people when they ask you to commission a piece? Do they kind of just let you go, uh, go at it, or, or do they ask a lot of you uh, for certain elements that they'd like to see in the piece? 
Yeah, you know, I think commissions, it, it kind of depends based on, um, it's like a situation, the situation thing, you know, it's, I mean, situationally dependent, but I will say for the most part, recently, you know, the commissions that I do, I typically leave it up, I, I tell them, you know, I'd like to just do it myself, like, please leave it up to my vision and, and you know, you can give me some idea of what you might or might not want in a work uh, that I create, but for the most part, uh, if you could just leave it up to me, um, and, and just give me kind of a couple bullet points to go off of, that'd be the best way. Um, because then it really is kind of um, my own original work, reimagining or reinterpreting something that the, uh, the person commissioning me wants. Yeah, I mean, this citrus piece, it's, uh, I remember I created it and it just was very well received on Twitter. And so um, I'm, I'm really glad that it sold at auction. Um, to me, you know, I think still life is something that I really do enjoy um, looking at when I go to museums. And um, I don't necessarily think this is particularly still life. It's more so just a like a capture of uh, a group of oranges, right? But still, I mean, it kind of has those um, inspirations from still life paintings over the you know past uh, however long still life has been going on, right? Um, and so I just wanted to take a stab at, you know, creating something very mundane and simple as oranges. And, um, and yeah, I, I think this, you know, this work has actually been exhibited at my exhibition at Marfa. Um, and it's also been exhibited at the exhibition in LA that I had recently. And honestly, every time I see it, it looks absolutely stunning on the Danvis screens. And so you know, I'm really glad I've created it. And, and I'm really glad that people still support uh, this, this this piece of work. Overall, it was probably one of the best trips I've ever made, like just in my life period, I think. You know, like I would mentioned, I love road trips. And, you know, we had driven so far and so long that day. Those, you know, those couple of days, you know, from... You know, El Paso to Marfa, and then we went from Marfa to Big Bend, and then, you know, and then back, of course. Um, so lots of driving, loved it. Um, and then, of course, just went there, and it was just all, like, you know, crypto and NFT-driven art people. And, and so it was just wonderful. I mean, especially because it was happening towards the end of the year. I mean, I spent the rest of the, the earlier part of the year meeting people all over the United States just for different events. And honestly, everyone uh, who was like a diehard NFT person showed up to Marfa. And so it was really just this like congregation of people who are like diehard, you know, Web3 art maxis. And so it was a wonderful time. Um, and then, of course, like the exhibition itself was great. Um, we did it on that Thursday, I believe, with Glitch Gallery. And so really, you know, you know, like a huge shout out to Derek who helped me out with that. Um, and everyone else at Glitch um, who helped me too. And yeah, no, it was it was just a wonderful experience, I think. And I'd like if there's more opportunities for me to go back um, based on my schedule, I'd love to go back because and I would totally recommend anyone who's listening who hasn't been to Marfa to go to Marfa. I mean, it's not like NFT NYC or, you know, Art Basel where there's like a trillion events and, you know, you're kind of like you feel very stressed thin and everyone's like has an agenda you just go there and everyone's just kind of sitting around and having a really good time and everyone seems like they're good very good friends which for the most part they probably are um and so 10 out of 10 would recommend <laughs> no 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 no. I was, I was trying to i was trying to remember like what x copy but this is the only one that i've ever done and honestly i created this work um i don't even know why i created it like i think just one day i was just thinking you know, it'd be cool to do an X copy tribute. I think very similarly, you know, I was talking about how I like doing homages and Easter eggs. This one's very explicit, of course, but it's just like a reinterpretation of X copies all time high in the city and and kind of with my personal take. And so um, and so that's really it. I mean, I just that's uh, there's really nothing more I can say. I mean, I I just wanted to reimagine X copy, pay homage to the contribution X copies made in the space uh, through my art. And, and I've said this a lot, so it's not something that's a secret. Um, all of the work that I create, unless it's a commission, of course, commissions are kind of more confidential, but all the work that I create that's for myself to create or to sell um, or that's been sold is on my website. And so I don't really hide anything. I just don't really talk about it. And so um, all my art is on my website. Uh, you just have to look through it, you know. I'm so good. This was so awesome to see. I just wanted to just to come up and thank thank you guys for doing it. And thanks, Grant. Um, I, I was curious if you would ever be interested in or uh, have been inspired to uh, to design uh, a 3D space. 
I know that most of your work is in vector work and I'm seeing this gallery come to life. I know I, the, you did the uh, the proof gallery and have been starting to see your, your work in 3D environments. And is that something that interests you or something you'd ever explore in the future? 3D, like a 3D artwork you're saying, right? 3D artwork, 3D space, uh, immersive space, yeah. Honestly, I, I don't think so. Not in the near future, I think. Um, so I think... I, like I had mentioned before, I think I really like my art being digital, 2D, uh, not animated. I think that's that's a very intentional thing. I think I can very easily pick up uh, After Effects and, and stuff like that to animate. And, and I'm very eager to learn, but I just don't see that with my digital art. Now, I think there's things that I'm working on just like physically, just like without the context of digital art or NFTs, just kind of on my own time paintings and things you know, kind of sculptures and stuff. And I think that's really where I would work more on 3D aspects of my art and my practice. But within the context of digital, I don't think so. So you're saying there's a Nike collab in the future and the shoe is coming. That's what I'm, re am, I, am I reading between the lines? I'm just kidding. Um, okay, that's awesome. Thank you for the answer. And again, Grant, thanks for doing this. It's been, been really awesome to hear. Hey, what's going on? Hey. So which one was the X copy? I'm looking for the X copy one, and I love the whole gallery. I think you guys did a sick job showing off your work. Thanks for bringing me up. Um, thank you, Grant, uh, Antoni. Uh, this space is awesome. I just kind of happened upon it. Obviously, Grant, I'm familiar with your work, just having you know been in Web3 for a while, a while myself. Um, I guess kind of like, it's a little meta. I mean, this experience itself, I think, is is like a phenomenal way just for people to experience your work in new ways and just bring people in. Uh, my question to you, Grant, is like, I don't know, do you, do you see this or any other kind of um, ways to like, uh, I, I guess like bring people in or get closer even to your like your, your best collectors, your best, you know, um, followers, I guess like how, how do you see yourself like developing any relationship at all to like your collector, um, you know, base at this point? Are you are you referring to just in general or within the context of like on cyber and, and gallery spaces? Oh, yeah, in general. I mean, I think this is a perfect example of like a really innovative way to do that. But I'm just thinking like, you know, outside of this as well, just how do you think about, um, you know, kind of like developing that rapport with your collectors, if at all? And maybe it maybe it's just kind of like a arm's length type of thing. I don't you know, I'm kind of just uh, just curious about that. Yeah, I think it's hard. I think it's kind of a situation is situation basis i think it's a collector to collector basis and at the same time i think um you build a lot of relationships over twitter honestly you know talking to collectors talking to different artists um often there's a there's no middleman so the dialogue is you know directly from one person to the other um i will say i think what i've seen over the years since i've it's coming around to almost exactly three years in web3 I think one thing I've noticed is like, it does help when the collector base is very supportive of your art, regardless of um, you, you know, regardless of how much you talk about your art, I think seeing collectors very excited to talk about the works that they collect from me, I think is something that um, is independent of, you know, my relationships with them. And honestly, it's something that has bolstered, um, both my presence and and also just like other collectors as well. And I think really like that network effect of having a, a very strong set of collectors who believe in your art or, or just love your art in general, um, speak highly of it and, and support it. I think both with, you know, m you know, from a monetary standpoint, but also just being able to share their art, you know, share their perspectives on the art that they've collected and the art that they support, I think has been very beneficial. And it's obviously that's not something that you can, you know, necessarily like pick and choose. But um, I will say if you stumble upon that opportunity, I would definitely take it because that is definitely by far the thing that has kind of kept me afloat so far and, and has definitely supported me so far.